heaven. And if you'll have me for the next four weeks, hopefully you will. We'll see you at the end of this. But, uh, we're going to talk about weakness in ministry. And I'm looking at this tablet over here. And I'm looking at this cross that it's built out of and all the marks in the walls. You look around at the marks of these walls. God has been faithful to this community for 200 years. That's astounding. There have been weak times and times of harvest and joy in this community. And there's been times when there's only been a few believers who gathered together and held on to the faith that Christ is good. And so I'm glad that you're here. I'm really glad you're here. I'm so encouraged that you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to me for a couple of minutes. It'll be a few more than that. Sorry. So over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about weakness in ministry, how it's the key to strength, how it seems counterproductive, but we get in the way of the power of God when we try to be good enough, we try to be strong enough, smart enough, clever enough. And so... We're going to start with, we'll go with the slide. We're going to start with a message called the sent ones. And there's a, a purpose when, when, when you are praying about your coming pastor. Thank you for praying for his family. Please, he covets your prayers. I know it. doesn't know you yet, but the sent ones. Sentship. We're going to talk about that today a little, a little bit on. But that's so vital that the, the person who comes here to help you be sent here should be undeniable in him and in you. It's an aside based on. We're gonna talk about today about, about sonship a little bit. And then next week, we're gonna talk about whether or not our faith is true. Because it's very important that we know what the Bible says and it's very important that we submit to it. But it, is it important if it's not true? If there's, if there's one part of this book that isn't true, when the book claims that God cannot lie, then it's not really all that reliable. Next week, we'll find out just how reliable the faith is. And it's important to know that. It's important to know if this book is not true. I tend to love all believers. I'm sure that you're the same. You love coming together. But if it's just a clubhouse, then it's just a clubhouse. If it's true, then it matters. Then we're going to talk about the lost ones. Thank you for praying for the lost, that we know how to share the gospel with people in every situation. We're going to talk about the gospel. We're going to talk about the state of unbelieving man. And I'm going to go through some things that are less obvious, like atheism isn't the problem. We have all of these things that we want to argue against and we want to change in the world, but they're not the problem. It's not what we're sent here to do. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. And finally, the last is going to be very personal. We're going to talk about personal failure. I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of personal failure in my life. And it has tended to want to silence me, to reduce my ministry, sometimes even reduce my faith. So we're going to see if that's actually an issue or what we can do about it on the fourth week. So let's talk about weakness in ministry. I'm sure you've heard phrases like, with God, the way up is down. My unbelieving mother gave me a fridge magnet, and it says, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. And these things, they're cute and they're helpful because there's enough truth in them to pay attention to and they encourage us. That magnet's on my fridge to this day. My mom doesn't know what it means, but she thought it would make me happy. And it does. Over the next few weeks, we're going to hear what Scripture says about weakness in ministry. How we get strong in ministry by being weak. And I'm, today I'm going to build a foundation with a lot of Scripture. We're going to go through, we're going to read quite a long passage, but we're going to read three passages. Two of them are fairly long, one of them is quite short. But I think you can handle it, and I think that by the end of it, the Spirit of God will have you hungry for more. And I hope that the things we go over today are things that plague you through the week. I hope that you go home and you read John chapter 4, because we're going to be there. So an amazing woman in that chapter. So a little bit about me. I've been in ministry since a couple of weeks after I got saved, September 25th, 2005. And when I got started, I was too young in the faith, not grounded in truth, undisciplined, passionate, crazy, prideful, everything. All the things you don't want in ministry. 
But I had a passion as a newly saved man that he had saved me so that I could go out into the world and reach other people. I went out on the streets of Halifax and spoke to strangers. And I, I spoke to them about the most personal things in the world. Their personal sin, their fears, their beliefs. And what I found is everybody's the same. And some other believers I knew in Ontario were having the same experience at the same time. So we developed a national ministry to teach people how to share their faith in work situations, on the street, at home, where have you. Thank you. But you know what? That ministry taught me to be an expert, to be confident, to be strong, to know all the arguments. Oh, he believes this. That means I give him this argument. And that was cool. It was exciting. It's fun to go have people think I have all the answers. Guess what? I don't. And when I read the Bible more in my quiet time at home, I realized that God never called me to be clever. He called me to be weak. He called me to just say, okay, I'll do it your way. Maybe it doesn't make sense to me right now, but you're God and I'm not. So I, I left that national ministry. It was a great work. Joined with a few brothers to do a local ministry in Halifax. Just a few brothers, Friday nights, going out on the streets, sharing our faith. And what I learned by being with brothers who were, frankly, more interested in just obeying God than being God's warriors, was to be a little bit more humble. I started to rely less and less on my ability to argue and to be persuasive and build, you know, traps for people so that they can't get out of, and more to rely on just the power of the Word of God. I can't understand that my cleverness gets me in the way of the power of God, frustrates grace, and robs the cross of its power. And my weakness just puts me away. Can I hear a story in a bit about just reading? It's amazing. It's amazing to me. Hopefully it will be to you too. It's a Friday night on Spring Garden Road. And myself and John Wells and Fred Keating, two brothers whom I dearly love, trust and respect. They're monsters in the faith. These people are grounded in truth. They, they let me come along. So we've been ministering to this young man named Ben for about three years, week in, week out. And Ben had this idea that the world wasn't real. Nothing mattered because nothing was real. Didn't make a lot of sense to us, but he was sure of it. And he would not budge for three years. Well, this Friday night, 11.30 p.m., Spring Garden Road Coffee Shop. The three of us, we all got stuff going on in our lives. We're distracted, we're tired, we're upset, sad, weak. We were really weak. I'm standing with, with Fred, and we're just having a conversation. And Ben is sitting behind me with John. And John's got nothing left. John's a strong man. He's a successful businessman. Very, very smart. But he's got nothing left to give. So he just opens up the word of God, and he reads the words of Jesus as Jesus is being nailed to the cross. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Ben said something, asked a question, and his voice was completely different than it had ever been before. How can anybody forgive somebody for nailing them to the cross while they're doing it? Imagine that. Somebody's nailing you to a cross and you forgive them while they're doing it. The pain is still there. It's not like you've healed and you can reflect on it and like, okay, I understand. Well, John switched over to someplace in Acts where Stephen is being stoned and says something similar. And John goes to another passage and another passage and another passage. And I don't want to lie to you or mislead you. Ben did not get saved that night. But he asked a very important question that every evangelist wants to hear. After, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes of John just flipping through the scriptures, reading to him, Ben, this man who didn't believe the world was real or anything mattered, said, if I wanted to be forgiven, how would I do that? That question changed my life. An unbelieving man who I was delighted to see every week, but 
I didn't really know, had never been in my house, changed my life by asking that question. Because John didn't overwhelm him with scriptures related to what he was thinking about. Didn't trap him. Fred didn't love him to the point that he had to take us seriously. Fred's a walking teddy bear. He's, you know, we, we, we pair up pretty good. Fred gives him hugs and I give him truth. It's, uh... And I didn't deconstruct his worldview again that week. Show him that it was self-contradictory and therefore unreliable. There was absolutely nothing about us that won the day. We're tired, scared, sad, feeling weak. All that happened was John read the Bible to him without pretense, without calculation, and it spoke to him. And the Bible will speak to the bends in your life too. It says that it will. If this book is true, and it says it's powerful, let's just rely on it. Let's see if it's true. If it's not true, then it doesn't matter. We can all be good doing something else on Sundays. But if it is true, then it will have power. That might have power for Ben. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4, and then we're going to go to Romans 10, and then we're going to finish up in Philippians 1, just a couple of verses. And while you're, while you're turning to those now, I'd just like to cover that we're going to read the scripture before I try to teach it, because 1 Corinthians 14 says that prophecy is subject to the prophets. 1 Thessalonians 5 commands believers, commands you and I, to critically examine all things and hold fast to that, what is true. So my call here today is to present to you what I have learned. Your call, each of you, is to examine it and see if it's actually true. And if it is true, then to apply it appropriately. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth in the body for the edifying of itself in love. We could spend a year on that passage. Let's turn to Romans 10. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard of? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Finally, Philippians 1, start in verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Ephesians 4 tells us that Christ himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. One of the most important things that we can get out of this passage is that it's his choice. He's the one that decides, not us. It's his call. Even when it's you or I or neither of us. And these people are God's gift to the church to equip us for ministry. They're there to train us, to correct us, to maintain unity amongst us. It goes on to tell us that
sorry. The firm foundation that they provide helps us be secure so we can go take risks in ministry. We, we read about faithful acts in the Bible, and they're not by special people. You know, did Noah have special ark building skills? You say, hey God, I hear there's a flood coming. Right? That's not what happened. God said, build an ark. Gave him plans and I assume he just did it. Nobody had ever built an ark before. He wasn't skilled at it. So the job of these offices is to prepare us for the works of ministry. The job is to train us so that we are secure that when we do the works of ministry, that time and effort doesn't distract us from our faith. They prepare us for it. Acts chapter 6, we read about seven men who were chose to be deacons. There have been complaints received. People weren't receiving food. Hungry people were going hungry. Other things were going left undone. The apostles said, hey, everybody get together. We've got some instruction for you. And here's the instruction. You don't have to turn to it, but it's Acts chapter 6. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. The apostles knew what their ministry was. It was teaching and equipping the saints. And that that's, has two folds to it. One, the apostles shouldn't be neglecting that. They shouldn't step away from preaching the word to go clean aisles. Not that they're too good for it. It's just that their work, that's not what they were here for. The other side of this is people who were still needing to learn, who weren't yet wise, who weren't yet mature in the faith, shouldn't be taken away from the apostles' ministry. They should be there being equipped, lifted up. So it's two things. I value my ministry, so I will stick to my ministry, and I will try to get people who should be under my ministry out of my ministry. Just because they want to go do something else, it might be way better for them just to sit down and learn for another week, maybe longer. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers have the job of ministering to the body of Christ with instruction, training, and the maintenance of unity. This is echoed in 1 Timothy 3, where we get the qualifications of a deacon. Again, we call them qualifications, but Scripture doesn't. They're really just signs of maturity. The job of a deacon isn't so spiritual, isn't so complicated, isn't so hard, isn't so lofty that we need perfect people to do it. That's not what it means. It's just that if we send people to wait on tables when they should be being ministered by the Word of God, that we're actually doing a disservice to them. We're all weak, every one of us. You're weak, I'm weak. The people that built this building were weak, but they still minister to us. The people who built this building are ministering to us today. We have a place out of the wind, out of the, with the cold, with a great light. It's safe. Those people have a ministry to us today. But they were weak too. See, the devil is looking to distract us. And we can't give him opportunity to. It's going to and fro to see who we can devour. If you're not ready for something, then you're going to be easy prey. When I went out on the street and was talking to people about science and arguing with them about evolution and all these things that I thought made me so smart, they could have damaged my faith if I wasn't so bullheaded. They could have said, no, 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 you don't know this because the Bible's full of errors and all of this, and maybe I would have believed them. Thankfully, the Lord protected me from that. But I've seen other people fall for it, be damaged, because they weren't ready. Here's the thing, though. As we do our works of ministry, be it learning or actually going out and doing things out in the community, maybe cleaning this place, as we do these things, we become knit together. As I do something, you trust me more. You get to know me better. As you do something, the same happens to me. Ever work late at work? You know, you're, it's Friday, and the boss says, yeah, can you work till 11 o'clock, or you come in tomorrow morning? 
When you do that and the people around you step up, don't you trust them more? You might not like them, but you trust them. They're there working really hard, doing the same thing as you. When I was in the military, I had the same experience on deployment and home. And those bonds are not easily broken. It's a shared experience. And that's why, the God, that's why God made the church the way he did, as a family that works together, because human beings work that way. The church is an expression of the order of God. It's not, it's not actually anti the world. We're human beings, and he uses us like human beings. So when you do the works that you're gifted in, that you're called to do, it builds me up, makes me trust you more, makes me let, helps me be weak in front of you. Now, over the years, I've done the work of an evangelist. That's what I like to say. It's like t- Paul told Timothy to do. And that's my role here today. It's a big training for the saints. Again, your role is to see, to test what I say. Is it true or not? And as we do that, that's, that's our gifting here today. As we do that, we will knit closer together. Romans 10 talks about personal responsibility in the ministry of the Lord in the world today for us. Talks about people being sent. It says, how can they believe in him who they've not heard? It's a good question, right? How come that person over there isn't a believer in Christ? They drive by this building, they see our programs, we have a website. Maybe they've never heard of Jesus. Maybe they've only seen him on TV in crazy movies or you know, CNN reports or something. And how can they hear without a preacher? They can't. And how can they preach unless they're sent? We're talking about the sent ones today. And I want to tell you about a few specific sent ones. These were, like your motto says, real people, real life. They were living real lives, real time. He was a confident man, strong man. He's the guy that got things done. He's the guy you sent to do something, and you know it was going to get done. His experience skilled and strong and willing to work harder and longer than anybody else. He's the guy that you want to work in on the weekend with you. But he was unwise and unrestrained. We all have failings. There's a man timid from his youth, but pure in love and intent. It's like my brother Fred. Well-versed in the truth, but set in a sea of deceit and infighting. There's another man, had powerful intellect, think through things, explain things. He's well-versed in truth, able to explain it. He was relentless, unwavering, respected, and feared, but he celebrated murder. Sounds like a good guy. And then there was a woman, all alone. She made just about every bad decision you could make in your life. And at the end of this, she was alone and weak and barely carrying on. And yeah, she breaks my heart every time. It's kind of cliche to get upset when you're speaking to people, but she breaks my heart. Some of you here know who those people are. Maybe some of them are all of you suspect. But these were real people living real lives in real time, facing real challenges, just like you and I. And if we're being honest, we're on the list. I'm on that list. Oh, I don't know, maybe you are too. I think so. People into bed on it. Life point. Together you're called a stewiac. Thank you for praying for the community. The Lord works through prayer. Pray for this community. It needs it. And it is fruitful to pray. Pray to a God who answers prayer, uses it. Individually, we're called, each of us here, to so many more situations that we can control and we can't control, we can decide to be in. Sometimes they come upon us. As we read in Philippians, Paul says that he's thankful for their fellowship in the gospel. That word is an amazing word, fellowship in the gospel. It's a Greek word koinonia, and it means something akin to intercourse. It is a deep and meaningful knowledge with association and interaction. In the book of Acts, we read, and all through the New Testament, we read how it was 100% normal for believers to share Christ with people in their lives, 
in the markets, from city to city, from town to town on the roads. It was normal. Now relax, I'm not here telling you that you gotta go out on the street. My job here is to help you just be okay with your weakness, whatever state that you're in, and know that your ministry can happen in power and fruitfulness anyway, whatever it is. Because it's not about your skills, it's about being sent. Prayer, that was a beautiful prayer. I'm not praising you for your prayer, I'm just thankful for it. That the pastor who comes here is sent. Now the woman I, met, I mentioned a few moments ago, well, let's talk about who these people are for a second, I'm sorry, I've, I've missed something. It's Peter, Timothy, Paul, and the woman at the well. You know, famous, famous people, but they're real people. We, they're just like you and I. They had great things about them and they had some really not so great things about them. The woman at the well, John chapter four, please read that this week. It's amazing. It's the only place I'm aware of where it says that Jesus needed to do something. He needed to go through Samaria. He had an appointment with this woman at noon under the sun where she would be alone and rejected outside of city at a well. He needed to go through there. And he did. I'm only going to hit the high points, but the Lord had a conversation with her. He showed her care and mercy. Presumably, the other women in the city had gone out during the coolness of the morning to fill their water buckets and gone home. But she was there in the heat of the day and all alone. No safety, no community, no care. But the Lord was there, and he offered her living water. And he spoke to her about other things, and she recognized, could this be the Christ? And he confirmed it for her. Now this outcast woman, as soon as he confirmed it for her, she didn't sit there and bask in the joy that is the Lord, I would. Dude, don't ever try to revive me, okay? Because I know where I'm going. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him. She dropped her water bucket. The thing she went in the heat of the day to fill, she dropped it and went off into the town to the people who had rejected her to say, come and see the one who's told me everything I've done. There's, a, there's something. Hey, are you a sinner? Come see the one who'll tell you all about it. <laughs> that sounds exciting, right? Come and see the one who's told me everything I've ever done. Could he be the Christ? It's the same thing that Philip said to Nathaniel. Come and see. Revelation 22, 17 talks about the ministry of the church. It says that the spirit of God and the bride of Christ says, come. And let him who hears say, come. The second she received Christ, she was able to share him. That second. There's no other qualifications. That's it. Let him who hears say, come. And him who thirsts and whoever desires, let him take the water of life without cost. It's the same offer the Lord made to the woman at the well. This thing I learned about my life's ministry and when I tried to stop being clever, this is his work, it's not mine. I used to love accolades. Kevin, you know so much about this. Right? Don't we all? It's fun. I, everybody, we, we like compliments. It's better to know that it's his work and not mine. It doesn't depend on me. I promise you that whatever it is that you have set before you that the Lord has put in your path to do won't always be as easy as to say, hey, come and see. But I also promise you that it doesn't depend on you. It's not about your ability, your good looks, your bad looks, your age, your youth. It's about him. See, Ephesians 2.10 says, see, they're laughing about my bad looks now. This is terrible. My confidence is hurt. <laughs> Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's no call in a Christian's life to be superheroes to reinvent the wheel, to come up with the great new church expansion plan. This is all accomplished. We're simply to walk in the things that the Lord has done in eternity past. 
the Lord knew that the, the worship team wouldn't be available today. His work is not impeded by anything we perceive as our failures, by anything we perceive as our weaknesses. The fact that this assembly is here right now and you're gathered under the name of Jesus Christ is a beacon to the people across the street who don't understand it. And they may not treat you like it's a hopeful thing that you're doing. And they may insult you. But you are a beacon to them. Just like the woman at the well. Those people didn't want to hear from her. But she went in and said so anyway. And they say, okay, we'll go check it out based on what you say, sure. But then they said, now I believe. Because not because of what you said, but because of what he said. If you say, come and see to the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll show himself. Anybody who hears you just takes a peek. He's going to show himself. So the tough stuff, what do we do about this? What if we don't? That's the thing. What if we don't? What if we refuse to get up out of our seats, to open our mouths, to open our arms, to open up a book and read it to some guy named Ben a coffee shop? What if we refuse? A couple of weeks ago, we, saw, we celebrated the triumphal entry. And I'm sure that you spoke about the rocks. I wasn't here. The Lord was going into Jerusalem the first time in his earthly ministry, being willing to be called king. He was there presenting himself as Messiah the Prince, ready to be crowned. And the people recognized the day. There were people expecting him on that very day. We're going to talk about that next week. And they were singing psalms to him. And the Jewish leaders were quite upset about that, especially when they sung Psalm 118, because that psalm says that those people knew what day it was, and they knew who they were greeting with palms. Jewish leaders didn't want anything to do with that. So they complained. What did the Lord Jesus say? He said, if all of these be silent, if all of you, life point, be silent, the rocks will sing. We get to be part of the ministry that God is doing. When we refuse, we deny ourselves eternal rewards. But we also, perhaps worse than that, we deny ourselves the experience. I have memories I don't deserve. I have a memory of a man, 11 o'clock at night, who couldn't walk away from me. It was like there was a nail in his foot. He's so angry, spitting mad at me because I would dare ask about his sin. He couldn't go away until he heard the whole message. I don't deserve that, me that memory. It wasn't me. I wasn't compelling. I was probably a jerk to him. I don't know. The Lord was good. He was speaking to that man. First person I ever saw saved on the, sheet, on the street. Big party. I don't know if you remember a few, maybe, uh, I guess it would have been 2005. They shut down Spring Garden Road for the first time. They had a big party. There was bands and everything. It's Saturday afternoon. It's blazing hot. And this guy's in front of me. And he believes. I got, a, I got a little painting of that on my wall. I don't deserve that memory. What an amazing thing. I remember the first time in my life the Lord saved somebody right in front of me. I was a bumbling idiot. I knew nothing except for the Lord. So don't deny yourself that. The Lord Jesus Christ needed to go through Samaria because he had an appointment. You've got appointments. I've got appointments. So the thing I know that we need to do today is that we take our next step seriously. If we don't know enough yet, well, let's get knowing. Let's get learning. If we do know enough, let's just do it. It's okay. We're going to fail. We're going to mess up. The Lord's going to use us. I was terrified to come speak to you today. No idea. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the testimony of faithfulness that you have done here in Stuiak. Lord, we look at these walls and we know we can trust you. Father, we look around at the people here and we know that you are still working, that you still love people, you're still saving people, you're still perfecting people. God, let us not be afraid of our weakness, but God, let us, let us use it to come closer to you, to rely on you more, to see what you're doing. Father, help us to walk, take that next step. Spur us on, God for your delight and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.